Welcome to the Salina Media Connection 2020 Candidate Interviews. I'm John Elmore, your host, and today we're interviewing Stephen Howe, who is a, a, the uh, Republican candidate for Kansas House of Representatives for District 71, and we welcome you. Thank you for being here, Stephen. Thank you, John, for inviting me. Glad to be here with your viewers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I'm a little in the dark. Um, I know what district I'm in, but what, what, district, uh, what does District 71 cover? Okay. District 71 covers primarily East Salina and Saline County. It goes as far as uh, just uh, where we're at now, a little bit west on some parts of 9th Street, but then on some parts of Santa Fe, and it runs all the way south, uh, pretty close to Magnolia, and it kind of zigzags around and so it finally straightens out all the way to the county line to the east uh, over by uh, uh, Solomon. So, so principally the east side of the county? Yes. Yeah, I see. So there's about 22,000 residents in the district. Well, that's an important post then. It you is. You know, to speak yeah. up for these people. Hey, tell me about yourself, um, where you grew up, where you've lived, uh, uh, what you've done, and what you're doing now. Okay. Thank you, John. I am, I grew up on a small farm in Riley County. Uh, my dad just retired a couple years ago. Uh, but I did that uh, after high school. I went to Kansas State University. And after graduation, I uh, was interested in public service. And I applied for an internship in Washington, DC. And so uh, I got an internship with, uh, at the time, it was Representative Jerry Moran. And I spent uh, five months out there uh, doing an internship. And this is right around the time period where there was the lead up to the war in Iraq. So it was a very interesting time to be out there and, and kind of behind the scenes, if you will, uh, with uh, a lot of historic things occurring. And uh, after about two and a half years, uh, well, he hired me on his full-time staff. So I was a legislative correspondent, wrote a lot of letters, did a lot of legislative research and things like that. And after about two and a half years, he decided to open an office in Salina. And I was about ready to get back to Kansas too. <laughs> Washington DC was great uh, while I was out there, but it's a very expensive place to live. Mm -hmm. And so I saw, saw it as a great opportunity to get closer to home. And so I've been in Salina ever since 2005. So he allowed you to run that office? I did help uh, Monty Shadwick who at the time just came off uh, a term as mayor of Salina. And so I think back during that time period was the uh, Global Flyer event. So a lot of exciting things happening in Salina. So it was neat to be here. I worked in the United Building uh, at, at the congressman's office and did that in, until 2010. And during that election cycle, I went and worked for Monty Shadwick. He did run for Congress. And uh, he didn't end up going the whole distance in the election cycle. And so then after he uh, bowed out of the race, I went and worked for Tracy Mann, who I had met at Kansas State University, and we had been friends. And so um, long story short, Tracy did very well in that primary, although not uh, well enough to get elected. Tim Hill's camp won the Republican primary and then the general election. So after Tim was duly elected, he asked me to come lead his district staff. And so that was a neat opportunity to build something from the ground up. And uh, so we established an office here in Salina, uh, one in Hutchinson and Dodge City. Then after uh, redistricting, uh, we opened a satellite office in Manhattan as well because Riley, uh, Manhattan and Riley County entered into the first district too. So. Um, <laughs> had kind of, uh, well, it was about 13 and a half years in federal public service, uh, working for two members of Congress, and uh, enjoyed my time doing that. But uh, after uh, Tim Hewlett's camp was not reelected, I spent some time uh, taking time out of politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for the last two years, I've been teaching uh, fifth grade and sixth grade at Cornerstone Classical School. It's located on South 9th Street here in Salina. And I teach primarily humanities uh, to those students. Uh, and humanities could be anything from literature, writing, uh, grammar, 
I do teach some math and science too, so uh, I do get to broaden my horizons <laughs> a little bit. But, At uh, least it's not the harder stuff, the high, the yes, high school stuff. <laughs> yes, but, but it's been an, an enjoyable experience. And this past spring, I, um, uh, with the global pandemic, it was coming, uh, becoming more concerning here in the United States uh, around that time. And I read an article, I think it might have been in one of the newspapers out of Topeka, Topeka Capital Journal. But it was talking about the average age of the state legislature. It was around, I think, uh, above 60 years old, and about two-thirds of the legislature was at risk, population, and there was a lot of concern about whether they could conduct a legislative session. And I had been thinking about for a few years about running for public office and stepping up to serve uh, those in my community. And uh, with the support of my wife, she encouraged me to, to take the leap of faith, and there's never a good time to run for public office, and so I decided, why not? Global pandemic, let's, let's go for it. So I, I, I feel like uh, my years of service in a congressional office where I worked with a lot of various people from all walks of life, just trying to help them navigate the federal government or bureaucracy, um, I felt like I could maybe utilize that in a, in a different role. So. Fantastic. Yeah, but I, I'm married, uh, happily married with uh, four children, uh, four boys uh, from the age of 13 to one. So <laughs> we've got all... Doing it all over again with the little yes, one, huh? Yes. <laughs> and you forgot how much work it was. It, it is a lot of work. <laughs> and I'm not getting any younger. So. Well, fortunately, older brothers are around to kind of uh, mm -hmm. occupy that little one sometimes, huh? Yes. He's very helpful and uh, they're learning a lot too. So it, it, it's a great... A great joy to do wow. that. Wow, so. sounds like a, a wonderful family. Hey, I got a question for you. Um, you've already told me why you're running. You thought, well, uh, maybe I can help, right? And uh, <clears throat> uh, when you've been campaigning this year with the COVID restrictions, what have you been doing to promote your yourself to be voted for? Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, and I'll have to tell you and the viewers as well that I filed the run on the last day you could file. Uh -huh. So nothing like waiting till the last minute to make a, a major decision like this. But uh, so I had to do a lot in a short amount of time because that was June 1st was the deadline. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to Topeka at probably 11 a.m. and the deadline's at 12 p.m. <laughs> right at noon. So I had uh, a lot of work to do after I uh, signed my name uh, to run and did the filing fee and everything like that. I really didn't have anything organized. So it was a lot of uh, standing things up, whether it was a Facebook page. How do I reach out to my community? Mm -hmm. People, you know, I'm not a native Salinan. I've been here 15 years though, and not everybody knows who I am. And so how do I reach these people? Mm -hmm. And so doing things like that, making phone calls, sending letters, you know, having to raise some money, which I've never had to do because I've never run for public office, but uh, it's been a good experience. Um, so later in the summer, I was able to do some door-to-door, uh, -door, and I was trying to figure out how to do that because we were just coming out of this uh, uh, reopening phase in, in June, and it was kind of staggered about what you could do. And I, I felt people might be a little apprehensive about a stranger knocking on their door. So I got some really nice door hangers, and I felt that was the best way to do it. So I, I put door hangers on. If someone was out in their yard mowing or something, I would definitely introduce myself or if they're on their porch. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the most part, I try to keep uh, a healthy distance, you know, uh, <laughs> and not try to uh, make people feel uncomfortable. But uh, uh, so we did, I did, and I had some volunteers from my church and some other people that I'm friends with, and we covered about 3,000 doors over the summer. Um, I felt like I got in better shape a little bit. So, uh, <laughs> I think that would work. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a little difficult being out there when it's, you're not used to being out there when it's, you know, 95 degrees and right. you're, you're walking precincts and whatnot. And then you have so. to remind yourself it could be worse. It could be worse. <laughs> and I had done that before with some other political campaigns. But yeah. Uh, yeah. It was interesting doing it when it's your name on the card. So. 
<laughs> That's right. So. Okay, well, let me uh, ask some questions on some specific topics. Okay. One is about uh, what's your position on Medicaid expansion in Kansas? Mm -hmm. Well, I know that's something that's come up in different sessions of the legislature. Yeah. I'm a little bit more uh, reserved in, in saying I would support that, and I've come out on different surveys saying I would not support the expansion of Medicaid under the Obamacare uh, law or the ACA. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very concerned about how we would pay for that. Uh, just in recent years, uh, we've, well, at least the courts have determined that the legislature hasn't dedicated enough money uh, for our schools. And so I'm just very concerned, where are we going to get the money to pay for it? So I'm open to having hearings about these things, but when it comes to raising someone's property tax or if it's a senior living on fixed income, you know, I'm very concerned about uh, people's margins right now, especially in a global pandemic. Um, however, that doesn't mean I don't care about uh, people that are maybe uninsured or they yeah. feel like they're in a spot where they just cannot afford traditional insurance or they don't qualify for Obamacare. Mm -hmm. So I'm very understanding of that. You know, for the last four to five years, I haven't had insurance, you know. Mm. I have what is called a Christian care sharing ministry. Sure. Sure. So it's not legally insurance, but it serves the same purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, what I would like to do as a representative is to talk to not only the consumers, but people that are in the healthcare industry. What can we do to lower the cost of services and make it more accessible to a, a, a wider population, regardless of your insurance status? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if we do ex expand the Medicaid program, someone's going to have to pay that. And uh, I the think federal government do, is just yeah. uh, spending and spending and spending, and they can do that, but the state can't uh, do that. They have to balance their budget. So, That's um, true. I, I think when you're talking about lowering costs, you have to talk to the insurance industry, too, as to how they yeah. handle claims. Mm -hmm. um, if they're only going to pay 65% of whatever the doctor bills, those bills are going to be high just to help them cover their cost. And so I think both sides probably need to be addressed. Um, so maybe that's something that could be brought up for discussion in some committee you know, in Topeka as far as how it works here in Kansas. Right. And I know that was primarily the initial starting point for the uh, discussion about the Affordable Care Act was what do we do with this health and uh, cost inflation that's really eating into household budgets at an ever increasing rate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's really brought down health care costs as much as maybe they hope for. And so I, I, I want to work hard at uh, finding solutions to that. I don't have all the answers. And when I go up there, I'm going to be one of over 100 different representatives in the House if I am elected. And, uh, of course, the, the Senate has to go through their process as well. So there has to be uh, some understanding uh, between a lot of people with various priorities. And, but I'm open to learning about everybody's priorities and, and seeing if I can get a better understanding of what is it that we can do that can benefit the average person uh, and uh, make it a little bit more affordable. Mm -hmm. Because I do believe we have a great health care system in our country, but it has a lot of room for improvement as well. So. Well, I'm glad you say you're open. I mean, that, you know, you'd be a new person there, and I don't know how closed off people get after a few re-elections re to, to the House. But um, at this point, I think dialogue and hearing what people have to say, and like you said, learning, is a very important thing, especially if you're new to the house. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it's definitely important for me to, to learn. And uh, I was just having discussions with people yesterday about their specific issue. And you can get really into the weeds on some of these things. <laughs> and some things you, you just don't, you're, you're not aware of, because I'm not in, involved in that industry on a day-to-day -day basis. So right. Right. I'm glad to, glad to learn. But I have learned a lot about healthcare and just uh, starting a family. Uh, so <laughs> our, our first boy was an emergency C-section, and then after that, 
we uh, tried to go more of a traditional route in terms of the delivery, which we were able to do, but at the time we had to go to Wichita mm -hmm. because we they had certain regulations here in Salina that wouldn't allow a natural for birth that. after a C-section. Yes. Right. So there's a lot of things I've learned and <laughs> how much things cost as well. Immunizations cost a lot apparently because <laughs> I didn't think anything of it, but my uh, plan doesn't cover immunizations. And so when our, uh, son, uh, our son was born this past, not this past, but uh, the summer before, uh, we took him in for immunizations. And uh, we get the bill later, and it, it was co quite the sticker shock of how, how costly those are as well. So um, I'm, I'm continuing to learn a lot. Uh, about the, the cost of health care. I guess that's the third part of the whole thing, the drug industry. Yes. And what they charge here as opposed to elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you mentioned education. You are now an educator. And um, the, the whole idea of funding, you know, education. Um, what are your thoughts on expanding support for K through 12 education or whatever, whatever that means? Expanding support through uh, funding or through just funding. Yeah, funding. Talk, talk about education funding. Okay. Well, I do think it is the legislature's duty to fund our schools. Now, of course, there's a disagreement, obviously, between some people that don't believe the legislature is doing enough to fund the schools, and that's why we've had these continuous cases since the early 2000s mm -hmm. uh, about uh, you know. You know, are, are they being fund, funded adequately? Is it equitable? And, and all sorts of uh, complex issues. Because, you know, a uh, school district in Johnson County is quite a bit different than something out in Johnson County or Johnson City, Kansas, out in w southwest Kansas. So mm -hmm. uh, I do understand the, the, uh, uh, the desire to try to equalize uh, per pupil payments across the board, but that gets very complex. I've tried to read the school finance formula, and it is very complex, and I, I wish it was a little bit easier to, for the average person to, to just understand and digest all that information. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of uh, our schools, uh, if you look around uh, Salina, the community has invested and stepped up to invest in our schools with bond issues and, and things like that. And so you can have a, put a lot of money into bricks and mortar, but are you getting better outcomes in terms of education? And so it's not all about the money necessarily because I've looked at some uh, statistics from the Kansas Association of School Boards that show how we are in comparison to some other uh, contiguous states or states in the Midwest. And Minnesota spends a lot more Per pupil than we do, but we have better educational outcomes according to the information I looked at. However, you have North Dakota spends quite a bit more than we do, but they have better outcomes. So I want to learn and figure out what is it that they're doing that they're having some success and, and what areas can we improve upon. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I do think, uh, I don't think it has to be terribly complex in terms of uh, what we're doing in the classroom. I would like to uh, empower local school districts to have more autonomy when it comes to how they want to uh, implement an education system for their community. So I'm definitely in support of local control and uh, um, empowering more people locally to have a uh, vested interest in, in, mm -hmm. and, and voice in uh, the education their kids are receiving. So. Right. Would that be a committee that you'd be interested in, something to do with education when you're in, if you're in Topeka? Perhaps. Perhaps uh, there's a whole long list of committees. Yeah. Uh, what what else there. interests you besides education as far as committees go? Uh, education. There's transportation with J.R. Clay's moving on to the state senate because he's then opposed in the general election. Uh, he had done a lot of work with the transportation committee and uh, representing uh, this area that has two major interstates uh, yeah. coming by and uh, Kansas State University and our air, uh, regional airport out here. And so there's a lot going on when it comes to transportation in our state. And so th that is another area I would look at. 
So you have healthcare, education, transportation. I've worked a lot with veterans in the past as well. So uh, then you've been helping me. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up on a farm. So yeah, farmers too. So I guess it would depend on uh, who's elected. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what leadership positions or who's in the leadership positions and how they want to. Who you uh, want to work with? How the, what teams they want to put together? Sure. So. Yeah. yeah. So, so no matter how, how many years you've worked with uh, uh, political uh, candidates in their, in their serving the country, you have a lot to learn, don't you? I do. I do. And in the 13 years that I spent in two congressional offices, I worked on issues from Social Security to telecommunications to working with ag groups and the commodity groups on the farm bill. Uh, I've met with uh, whistleblowers who had worked at the VA. Uh, I've done a host of different things. And uh, so I, I'm just open to learn and willing to serve. And I, I believe we have a great country and great people that live, live here. And I believe that there's a lot of people that care deeply about the direction of our country. And, and I just want to step up for the area in which I live and to represent mm -hmm. uh, them and for them to have a voice in, in the legislative process. So I, I want to see the legislature be open to having hearings uh, having, you know, let's have, if there's two sides of an issue, which there always seems to be, right? There might be three sides, I don't know. But let's, let's do our work and let's do it well and govern well. And I think sometimes as a Republican, I've noticed that sometimes when, if there's a big swing in an election cycle, you know, that new majority coming in feels like they have to brand everything under their party umbrella. And I don't think that's necessarily all the time, uh, necessary to do all the time. I think sometimes people overreach in terms of their uh, governance. And I, I think we just need to do the small things well and, uh, you know, not make it too uh, difficult on ourselves mm -hmm. either. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I definitely want to be a citizen led legislator and uh, try to model myself after that. As you think about the state government and and the House in general, um, what things do you think should be discussed more or dealt with maybe a little differently? Have you seen a few things that you'd like to have a voice in? Sure, I, I think you know this probably could be at the national and state level in talking about the money in politics. Uh, that's something that seems to have interest on both sides of the aisle when it comes to our you know, electoral process. Uh, you know, I have some personal opinions about what I think uh, might be uh, some uh, ways to, to go about our campaign finance laws and things like that. I'm not sure everybody would agree with that, but uh, I think there's some areas that we could uh, open it up and make it uh, less bureaucratic and more transparent. So. That sounds good. But, that sounds uh, good. I, I, um, I've noticed from the uh, campaigning for um, national offices that most of them are negative about the other candidate rather than, here's what I'm going to do for you. Mm -hmm. um, and that disappoints me. I mean, I, I think you probably have seen it too. I'd rather have straight campaigning where they're just saying, I've been in office for this long and here's what I intend to do in my next term. Or, you know, here's what I, I can bring. Now, obviously they're doing that too, but it just seems like, now it may be out of their control too. It may not be the candidates themselves and their campaigns doing this stuff, but other side interests putting out this material. So right. this is part of what you're talking about, where sure. the money's coming into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and unfortunately, they, uh, at least on the national level, they, you know, the, Commission on Presidential Debates, you know, they're putting together the rules for these uh, 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 forums or candidate uh, debates or whatever they're calling them. But uh, I think they recognize the enter entertainment value it has <laughs> and uh, the revenue stream it could create for some of these major uh, corporate entities. And uh, it, it's less to do with uh, uh, really connecting with 
the people, I think, in some cases. You know, it's a lot of red meat being thrown around. It, it feels and, uh, like they're just trying to say, here's how we're different, instead of here's how we're alike. Mm -hmm. You know, and <clears throat> no matter who's elected, they're going to be our elected official. And so we need to be able to go to them with our voice, no matter who it is, if it's you or mm -hmm. if it's your opponent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm glad that you want to learn, and I'm glad that you want to listen, and I'm glad that you want to share, and that's a good thing. Um, is there anything that we should be working on or paying more attention to right now? I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit about that. That's sort of a side issue. Mm -hmm. But with the government itself here in the state of Kansas? Uh, I think the biggest concern uh, that we need to really be honest and open about is trying to get our kids back in, into school. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate to be able to teach right now for students in grade five and a little bit of grade six. And being a smaller school, we've been able to uh, uh, have a little bit more flexibility, if you will. Uh, we've been following the governor's uh, executive order about uh, how to comply with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm wearing a face mask eight hours a day. We're doing social distancing and hand washing every hour as well. And, but I, I do think that there are a lot of kids out there that they may be in a hybrid schedule right now. Um, you know, how can we get them back to a more normal and traditional school year? And of course, you know, no one wants to put the kids or teachers or support staff in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot we're learning and it's a very fluid, seems to be a very fluid situation. And the part but, that's out of your control is what are conditions at home? That you is know, true. And how is the family handling this and are they observing what you're trying to do at the school? So at least you're you're hitting it at the beginning of the school day and you're trying to keep everyone from infecting each other if someone happens to have a problem. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, the one thing that, that I would like the government to pr project is, you know, be open and, and truthful about things. You know, no beating around the bush. You know, let's just be open and honest about this and how can we work together to, to, to get kids back in the classroom. There's a lot of families you know, two-parent working families or single-parent uh, working families, and they might be working two to three jobs, and they've got young ones at home. Maybe they can't afford mm -hmm. uh, those extra expenses uh, throughout the week to um, mm -hmm. uh, have someone watch their kids and make sure they're getting on their tablet or their electronic device and mm -hmm. having the necessary supervision to do that. So right. um, uh, I'd... I'd Definitely want to work with others and uh, the, the legislature to see what we can do to support our school districts to make sure, you know, are, are there too many re regulatory things that are uh, tying your hands from doing, d moving forward and, and getting kids back in the classroom? Or, mm -hmm. you know, what is it that we can do to help? So I'm glad to work with our uh, local school boards in the county to see what we can do to uh, provide them the support they need from the state. So. Fantastic. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you think needs to be discussed? Well, that's a good question. You're going, oh, where do I begin? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there always seems to be a hot button issue. Uh, you know, probably back in 2006, I think the Smoky Hill River went dry because of the drought. And we had very hot summers and it wasn't raining much. And so there was a big concern over water. Now it seems like we although it's dry uh, right now, we're doing okay on uh, the water. Uh, but that always seems to be a, a big issue in Kansas, you know, mm -hmm. our, uh, how we use water and uh, kind of, you know, how we administer that, whether it's a municipality or is it in agriculture and all and industrial use as well. So that's one of our most precious resources in our state. And we have to, um, that's one thing that, uh, Governor Brownback at least addressed is trying to work on a 50-year plan about how we can better use our water, uh, whether it's groundwater or surface water. And so I applaud him and his administration for uh, talking about that because that was an issue that was long overdue to talk about. So uh, I think the legislature will probably continue to work on that issue um, into the future, especially as uh, folks in western Kansas, they're 
uh, water tables uh, or, or lower, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. And uh, in some places, they've come up a little bit, but you know, it, the, the trend doesn't look um, that great yeah. in some parts. Is there any other hot button? You know, you talked about this, and you went back to 2006, and we re related it to today. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be a hot button for you right now? I mean, you've talked about some of these things. Yeah. Hot button issues, I would say, would be you know, anything related to the COVID-19 and how the government's handling uh, you know, the mandates. You know, and are they uh, singling out certain groups of people or entities for stricter uh, guidelines? You know, there's been some pushback with churches and uh, some other organizations that feel like they've been singled out a little bit more than others. Uh, you know, there's a lot of small businesses uh, in Kansas that are, some have closed and some are right on the margins of, you know, making those decision, decisions. So we need to keep uh, commerce flowing, people, uh, you know, being able to do business, uh, especially our small businesses, uh, because when they had the shutdown, we had a lot of the big box stores still open, right? And they were still uh, selling a lot of stuff. And uh, right. I'm glad we have those places to, to, uh, to do business. But, um, you know, when you're singling out a mom and pop store and telling them they have to close, but yet, you know, a multi uh, or a national internet or not a, uh, uh, a very pre uh, well known big box store has to, they can stay open for business. I think it's unfair. So we have to look at uh, fairness as well. Um, uh, re re religious liberty is a, a huge issue for me uh, and a lot of people in, in Kansas as well. People want to be able to uh, practice freely their religion and exercise, uh, exercise their constitutional rights. So that is something I want to uh, ensure is not taken away or taken for granted by regulators or, or people that uh, may have a different view about how they would treat uh, religious freedom. Um, I'm a staunch defender of life. Uh, I believe life begins at conception and I'll support strongly uh, life to a natural death as well. And so that's a big, a big window, right? <laughs> or it could, end, be, yeah. <laughs> uh, it could be incorporate a lot of different uh, issues. Sure, sure it could. Yeah. But that is one thing in the, the state Supreme Court last year had a ruling that basically said the Kansas Constitution guarantees uh, a woman's right to an abortion in the state of Kansas. And in the last session of the legislature, they introduced uh, legislation of value them both amendment. Uh, they didn't get enough votes apparently to get it on the ballot for this fall, but I would support something similar to that. And that would be amending the state constitution to uh, basically articulate that life does begin at conception and uh, um, protect uh, some of the safeguards that were put in place prior to that state Supreme Court ruling. So protect, protect them life. both is for the unborn and for the elderly? Is that what you're trying to say? I didn't know what protect them both meant. Oh, value them both? Value them both. I yeah. think it's supposed to speak of the mother and the, mother and, and the child. And the child. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Because it's kind of uncertain because of the state Supreme Court ruling. You know, that there's a lot of other laws in place to protect, you know, maybe a juvenile. You know, you have to have parental consent before you would go to you know, uh, mm -hmm. an abortion clinic, mm -hmm. per se. And so there's a lot of uncertainty whether those uh, still are uh, uh, viable laws because they've kind of un As in informing the unraveled period some or things. whatever. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things to talk about there in Topeka. So that's a hot button. It's yeah. been a hot button since... Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, Statewide. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. But that would give the voters a chance to decide, you know, if they want to amend, amend the state constitution. So, and they're right. calling it the value them both amendment. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we've heard a lot, lot of interesting things from you, Stephen. Sure appreciate you being here with us. Uh, we've been talking with Stephen Howe, Republican candidate for the 71st district of the Kansas House of Representatives. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Stephen. Thanks for being here. 
Thank you, John, and I appreciate Salina Media Connection reaching out and putting this forum together. Thank you.